Okay, here we go. After about 30 minutes of jacking around with trying to get video equipment to work right and trying to do the live stream so I could share pictures on the screen, I've given up with that. I'm just going to record a video and then hopefully we'll underlay some, uh, some of the images from the gameplay that I want to talk about uh, in a minute. We'll do, we'll, we'll do some post-production editing. So I wanted to talk today about Victory Roads or Roads to Victory or whatever it's called. What's it called? Victory Roads, right? Yep, Victory Roads. I had to look on the screen. So I've been calling it uh, Roads to Victory for ever, and I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. And uh, I've already posted on this game previously, and uh, I played solo. I played three or four turns solo and had a you know okay experience, but was left thinking, man, this is a lot of hard work for... Uh, not a lot of game enjoyment and I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to play this weekend to do a four player game and that allowed us to split up the the two fronts kind of uh, basically divide uh, the game from the northern section uh, so up to the, the Baltic and then down to the Privet Marshes and then from the south of the marshes down into the Carpathian uh, mountains and off we went lots of fun so that proved to be a great experience i'll just kind of kind of net it out there and in playing it as far as we did i think we got to start of turn 10 made me realize that the game is indeed a lot of work when you're playing the campaign game uh, but there is a, a level of reward there that's probably worth the work I, I, i'm not sure that it's worth it solo though it, you're probably better off flipping the maps over and playing with the larger hexes and playing some of the smaller scenarios. So there's a Bagration scenario, then there's the Fall of Romania, and then there's something up in the north as well. Uh, kind of the Konigsberg area, that sort of thing. So you can get the full campaign feel and flavor in the main, uh, but you don't get to capture Berlin if that's your goal. Uh, our gameplay, I, I think the commentary that came out of it from the from the four players in general was hey, interesting. Lots of fair amount of work uh, in choosing support chits and when to use them, how to use them, and all that sort of stuff. And I want to talk a little bit about how we played and what we would have done differently and where we think we could improve uh, the gameplay for ourselves. And I probably don't want to spend too much time on the game mechanics necessarily. If you want to dig into that, I've written about it uh, in regards to Liberty Roads and it's exactly the same game system. So you might enjoy reading some of that if you can find it on the blog. Uh, we might touch on a little bit depending on how long this thing goes. So if I actually get to the point, we'll get started, right? So uh, the first couple of turns, uh, pretty critical for the Soviets. The opening offensive starts in a very uh, tight band and uh, of hexes, and they have you know eight, ten, or eleven support chits they're allowed to use thereabouts. I think we ended up with eleven based on the die rolls that uh, occurred in our gameplay. I'm just going to flip back to the game notes here. Uh, um, Yeah, and so that that opening scenario, the opening of the scenario is critical. If there's not a really good penetration for the Russians and a, and a breakthrough for the Russians, it's almost worthwhile resetting that little section of the map board, uh, like resolve all the combat there first and do all the exploitation and see where you get to. And if you don't get where you need to get to, then you probably want to reset that section before you go off and play the secondary objective areas or whatever, which I don't think you do on turn one anyway. So turn two, fast forward, uh, <coughs> primary objective was placed elsewhere, south of the, of the marshes. Those attacks kind of went off okay, uh, fairly heavy losses for the Soviets. And the Germans kind of held their own. The Soviets pressed over in turn three through some of the fortifi fortified lines in the south, and there was very much two different games going on. So in the southern game, played by two different players, uh, there was a you know, one long contiguous line, basically, of, of opposing counters and fortified lines and rivers, and wherever there was a, a breach, the German player was able to mass a handful of 
uh, Panzer divisions and sort of nip that in the bud and kill actually kill four or five steps and maybe three or four cores of worth of uh, Soviet armor which massively degraded their ability to have effective uh, punching power, right? So that's part of the trick with the game is even as even early in the game, I think there is an argument for taking those good, solid four to one attacks as the Germans that you uh, can, if you can get a good result. Uh, up in the north, I was playing more along, I was playing for cities and choke points and rail uh, rail slash road movement areas. So my lines were not contiguous at all, and in fact were you know clusters of of units and he uh, around hexes that were that mattered. So Minsk matters uh, because there's a, a multiplicity of roads that kind of all come in together there. Uh, some other areas that were if you broke through there, the south of Minsk would be a problem. So we had a lot of units there. And then I also had an opportunity to do a few counterattacks as well early in the game. So we kind of, uh, the, the Soviets got an okay start to the exercise, but as the game went on, once we got to the game turn five or six, we realized the Soviets were now at about three to five weeks behind the historical timeline. Uh, but of course, there's a, a price that was paid for that, a lot of German losses. Uh, so the, the, the losses pile was five to seven divisions a turn, and that was pretty, pretty aggressive losses, probably in exchange for four to six steps of uh, Soviet uh, forces being uh, impacted. And my camera is about to fall over. There we go. And now the camera's crooked. Bear with me. All right, so that uh, that posed that posed some challenges for the Soviets because they were, you know, obviously having to constantly recycle their units and pull pull forces out of the Stavka boxes, which are available. Uh, fine for them; they got lots of replacements. So the Germans didn't, and I think the Germans probably stayed a turn too long on the line, they should have started pulling back in the north a turn earlier and certainly at least two turns earlier uh, off the fortified lines uh, in the south. And in Romania, there was a, a, a minor breakthrough which ended up uh, becoming somewhat of a rout. But what happened there was that the Soviet got, player got very fixated on wiping out Romanian units and forcing the capitulation and the surrender there which kind of caught the Germans a little bit by surprise. We weren't uh, quite 100% uh, up on those rules, uh, much to our detriment. And then I think uh, that, that, but that the Soviets didn't sort of reorient and push forces uh, back up to the north to reinforce what was starting to be quite an effective push south of the marshes through the fortified lines and then potentially onwards into the Grosse Deutschland uh, area. Now, all that said, by turn nine, we'd had two or three turns of build a line, destroy a line, build a line, destroy a line, and retreat one or two hexes. And the Germans in the north had uh, used, we, we sacrificed some uh, satisfaction of the Fuhrer, and went against the will of the Fuhrer, and did strategic movement, and uh, moved back uh, fairly aggressively. And we also did that in the south as well. Uh, so. One thing I don't think we did enough was sacrifice uh, uh, the Führer's will. We should have the Führer's uh, happiness track, whatever they call that track. And uh, and I think we could have. We were naturally you lose favor with him anyway. But I think we should be more aggressive in using that and just getting to zero, then reboot, rebooting, and then uh, because when you're up at you know eight or nine on that track, you're getting three or four support tokens a turn and a higher replacement rate. We weren't getting as many replacements as well because we're always stuck down the low end, doing counterattacks, trying to keep ourselves in the game, uh, uh, stop stop that will from flipping, and I think we should just let that happen. So, so once we got to about turn ten, uh, it was looking pretty grim. Actually, it's looking pretty grim in the north. It was looking pretty grim in the south, and uh, we, you know, it felt like it was almost over for the Germans. Now, there was still a lot of uh, terrain to be taken because I'm going to look at the map here. I've gone on Vassal. Uh, we were 
uh, still in control of loads, still in control of Warsaw, in fact. Lvov had just fallen, game turn 9 or 8 or 9. And in the north, the uh, Konigsberg was well protected, and that river just, which is not labeled here, sadly. I don't see it anyway. I probably should know what that river is anyway, right? And, okay, here it is, the Neiman line. All right, so a quick little break uh, was taken just there. So let's try and come back to where we were. Uh, Konigsberg, Neiman River, or Neiman River as the case may be, uh, was where the Germans were advancing upon. Uh, sorry, were being advanced upon. Uh, so that would have been one of the first areas that we could have fallen back onto. Then, of course, Konigsberg and the fortified, fortified lines there on the map, if you look at the Vassal module, which I encourage you to pull up uh, and have a look at. I'll probably post some screenshots from it uh, as well in the video. So the thing then that I think we didn't get to, uh, turn 14, 15, 16, there probably ends up being another 30-odd German units that enter the map uh, and in, in the greater Germany area. And I think with the remnants of the two sets of forces, North and South, um, basically Army Group Center and Army Group South, between those two groups and the reinforcements, I think there's enough, or there would have been enough in our particular game anyway, to hold that Danzig line, that river down through Warsaw, down into uh, the foothills of the mountains to Krakow, uh, keeping Hindenburg for quite a period of time. And then you're able to drop back again to the Posen uh, fortified line, and uh, that then becomes Bromberg up north, and then uh, still staying on that Dan Danzig line. It looks to me like it's very, very difficult for the Soviets to get to Berlin. And, uh, and, and I think in terms of optimizing the German play, we, we, we should have planned more effectively and uh, uh, moved sooner, withdrawn sooner, planned more effectively for the Romanian uh, collapse. And uh, I think uh, there was one other thing here. Yeah, keeping a couple of uh, groups of panzers off the line in reserve to be able to uh, be like a QRF force and jump in there and punch where they needed to and you know knock a step or two steps out or knock a core out here or there, chip away at the, at the infantry units because the, some of those infantry units that flip, uh, the, especially the Soviet ones, you know, they drop from a six, seven, or eight down to a one in terms of combat effectiveness. So that can be a big. Once you start knocking that stuff out, now the German, the Soviets, are relying entirely on armor for their combat power punching, and they're going to start losing steps on those as well. Because nearly every combat result is going to you're going to lose a step. I think as the Soviets, Soviets need to make vicious use of uh, the major offensives. Uh, a little earlier, uh, early in the game, so you do that first one in turn one. Probably needs to do another one in turn three somewhere. Uh, I would uh, be more aggressive. I think they could be more aggressive, uh, bringing the Stavka forces on sooner rather than later. Uh, and then I really think the big key for the Soviets is the two to one attack table. That two to one attack table. Uh, if, if I were to just kind of give you a quick rundown on how that works. There are one, two, three, four results that are poor for the Soviets. Uh, one is a no result, there's no, no combat effect. Uh, two, uh, three of them have uh, a, a step or two step losses for the attacker and then either one or none for the, for the defender. Those three results are the worst results, that, or two results are the worst that can occur, actually. The one zero is where you only take an attacker loss, and it's probably worth uh, having taken that risk, because every other result, there's only a, a, like three results here that have zero losses for the, uh, for the enemy, for the defender, and all the others, all, all other nine results, have uh, one or more step losses for the Soviets. And I think if you look at that and think about it for a second, you're like, hmm, I can afford to take a lot of losses, so I should just be pounded out as many 
two to one attacks as I can up and down the line. Uh, I think that was one of the other things that didn't happen for the Soviets as well, is they didn't put enough focus or emphasis on the northern part of the line. So I was able to just slowly thin that out, drive stuff south, and then only later in the game, maybe turn six or turn seven, uh, were the uh, Soviets, or maybe turn five, I don't know, were, were the Soviets able to start attacking up there with some level of confidence that they were going to get uh, a decent attack odds. But they, they were looking for three and four to one attacks versus two to one attacks. So certainly a powerful advantage. And I think probably around turn eight or nine, my opponent uh, Pete, uh, picked out, picked up that doing the two to one attacks was probably a good idea. So obviously the big swing factor in this game is the, the support chits. And if they don't come in the right way at the right time, it can make a big difference. If you don't get as the as the Soviets, you're really you're getting anywhere from five to eleven uh, support chits a turn, and depending on where they end up, you know that can make a big big difference to your combat for that turn. If you get uh, partisan counter, which is awesome because it turns everything, you know, makes everything clear terrain and halves you, puts the puts the defender out of supply, that's a beatdown, and that will change the game. Surprise attacks change the game. Whereas if you didn't get some of those on certain critical turns, then you're really up your creek without a paddle because uh, you can you can be you know chipping away at the Germans and they can just uh, do those one or one step replacements, and pop those infantry units back up to full strength, retreat back a hex or two or three, uh, or uh, you know if they want to spend a support chip, do a do a, a quick run for it in a certain area, set up a new defensive line in better terrain. And then move back and you know start all over again. So the game uh, the game allows you. Uh, there's a lot of variability there, so I think that's going to give you a lot of replay value. Uh, I don't think I need to go into too much detail on all the different uh, what happened in each individual turn, but you'll hopefully you'll be seeing pictures uh, in the corner uh, here that will allow you to see. Uh, what what went on turn by turn and some close up shots and and just know that it's all chronological so ideally uh, it'll be game turn one and game turn ten will be the last turn that you see so good good you know uh, when I look at, think about this it's a great decision space that we're playing in you're playing at that operational scale uh, you're definitely embedded in that uh, in the right role to make the right decisions uh, for for your forces uh, you have very clear objectives they're difficult objectives for both sides to achieve mainly uh, the Germans have to pre prevent the Russians from achieving their objectives which are difficult you've got to capture Berlin you've got to cause the fall of the Reich you've got to knock out the Romanians and all those things take time and effort and all that sort of good fun stuff so I think that's uh, done pretty well the OB um, there was some errata uh, a couple of little bits of errata here and there given the hundreds of counters that are involved <laughs> Who cares? It's not really going to make a material difference to the gameplay. Uh, that does remind me of one thing, though. There are a couple of really nice divisions down in the south that I would have been, been shipping, if I had probably paid attention to it, I would have shipped them into the center of the map uh, to support the defense of the southern Pripyat Marshes era, area uh, sooner rather than later. As the German player, I think that's another strategy I would in, in, uh, encourage maybe keep one division, uh, armored division, or two armored divisions down in the south, and push everything else up into that northern section, uh, but south of the Pripyat uh, marshes. Anyway, there's a little sidebar there. CRT is a lot of fun in this game because you've got this, these secondary tactical results, which if you're familiar with Liberty Roads, you'll know what that means. There's both an attacker and a defender tactical result, which may mean extra exploit movement or a retreat for the, the defender or an opportunity for the defender to uh, move a unit in kind of reserve mode, if you want to look at it like that. Uh, there's all sorts of other neat little uh, resolutions that go on that, uh, that add some flavor to the game and some nuance to the game. Plus, if you're an elite unit, you're able to move your, move your uh, result up and down within certain uh, restrictions. Uh, that's a that's a nice touch as well. Logistically, supply is pretty simple because there's no zones control. Uh, it's very hard to get stuff out of supply. 
but uh, having the headquarters units uh, as, as your guiding post for that means you can generally speaking, unless you're being enveloped or pocketed, keep everybody in supply. So supply doesn't really figure too much into the game here. Great narrative. I mean, I, I think we could very clearly see what was going on in our mind's eye. I think that was pretty powerful stuff. Um, and I think I've already mentioned the great, the great replay uh, value. My, so the downsides for me, uh, uh, playtime. It, it, it's a big, long game. We played uh, every bit of 12 hours or more to do nine turns with the opening turn taking an extensive amount of time. We played from probably 9.30, quarter to 10 on Saturday morning and, and finished up at five or six that afternoon and then played again the next morning from nine until noon with an hour and a half break for lunch. Uh, we went to some restaurant that took forever to get served. So uh, lunch took a long time on Saturday. So kind of a little, so that's why the smaller scenarios are, are very interesting. The components, of course, are gorgeous. There are uh, mixed feelings about the the logos uh, for all the unit uh, the unit identity logos. You either love them or hate them. My view is they look wonderful on the map, but they detract from the ability to set the game up rapidly uh, because you are now doing pattern matching, uh, icon matching, to find a unit versus being able to read the unit designations, which are the smallest f font on the on the counters and in, in a very thin font as well and very difficult to read so it's it's literally a pain in the ass to set this this up it took uh, hours to set the game up and uh, it's a, it's a failing of of just the the, the way that the way the counters are, are done right uh, they look beautiful and all that sort of good stuff but it's a pain in the ass to set up so the once again the smaller the smaller scenarios less units less time set up probably a lot more satisfaction out of that and i think just the bagration uh scenario you could play three or four or five times and get your money split out of the game without even touching the, the, the big campaign solo which i would not do and uh, the rules are straightforward as well really uh great rule book well written looking forward to buying anything else that comes out in this system even though I do not own this game anymore. I will play it on Vassal uh, in the future, but uh, not a game that I would uh, uh, I would plan on setting up again myself. Uh, we've got plenty of copies in our group, so we'll, we'll do it that way. All right, that's quick look and uh, feedback and uh, roll up on, on that uh, game experience with the four of us over the, lo the uh, long weekend. I appreciate you checking in on the, on the big board and hanging out with me to have a look at this, and I hope you enjoyed the pictures in the background. All the best.